Is it true that Christmas only comes once a year? Yeah? Uh, you know, we, you know we, we like to think, okay, it, it's, it's a day in time. We, we, prefer, we prepare for Christmas, and it comes once a year. But haven't you heard somebody say, this is just like Christmas? Right? And it wasn't Christmas? Right? I mean, you know, there's, there's certain events, certain things that happen, and you go, wow, this is so cool. This is just like Christmas. Well, what I want to propose today is that Christmas is maybe not just once a year. It may, maybe it's something that's more than just a day that we celebrate Jesus' birth, right? Um, matter of fact, there, there are some people that wish Christmas could be every day. I mean, wouldn't it be cool? I mean, you get the day off. You don't have to work, but you're paid for it. I mean, that's cool just in itself. And then you get to get up, and you, and you probably have, like, waffles, all right? Okay. Uh, that's after you open your stocking and you, and you get some presents. And, and then, you know, I mean, and Christmas is another day where pretty much everybody's nice to each other. I mean, imagine that. You know, I mean, I mean you, you kind of try to have to be nice to each other sometimes. But, you know, by and large, Christmas is a pretty good day for most people. For most people. Uh, so we, we kind of wish that it would be more than just a day. Maybe it's... it's it's this idea of love and peace and generosity to everybody, and we can celebrate that, right? I mean, we, we anticipate Christmas. We, we, we long for it sometimes all year long. And, uh, and when it comes, um, you know, we're waiting for it. It happens. And then after it's over, we, you know, kind of long for the next Christmas, right? But, uh, you know, people, like we've been talking about these last several weeks, people wait for a lot of things. <coughs> And the, the children of Israel, of course, they were waiting for you know, redemption. They were waiting for the Savior. They were waiting for the Messiah. And this last thing we want to talk about today is this idea of waiting for what they call the kingdom of God. All right? The kingdom of God. Now, to the Jewish people, the kingdom of God, waiting for that, was something that, that was directly connected to the Messiah coming. Their idea of a human Messiah that would be their deliverer nationally. Israel would, would be reestablished. It would be the kingdom of God in a nation here on planet Earth. The renewed national Israel. That's what they were hoping for, the kingdom of God to, to come back in the nation of Israel. But what really is the kingdom of God that, that the Bible talks about? Um, the kingdom of God actually carries its own definition if you look at it. Right? It's a kingdom. And when you're thinking about kingdoms, you're thinking about people, right? I mean, there's like the United Kingdom or, or the UK, they call it. And, and there's all these people with a funny accent, right? I mean, so, so you have this kingdom, right? And it's made up of people. And so the, the word kingdom means that there's this group of people that are under a, a kingship, under a law, under a rule of somebody over them. And so if it's the kingdom of God, it means that then there is this group of people who are under the kingship of God. Make sense? And so anybody who says, I want God to be over me, I want God to be my king, I want him to be Lord of all, he's the director of traffic, I mean... In reality, I mean, the best place on the planet to live would be in a nation or a kingdom where you have benevolent rule. You have a king who has the power, has the resources, the capabilities to keep you safe, to provide for you as a people, to ke- and, and, and care for you. I mean, if he, if he had a benevolent king, that's awesome. Because he loves you more than he even loves himself. He's going to take care of you. He's going to watch out for you. He's going to make sure that you're safe. That would be the best case scenario for everybody. And so here, now the kingdom of God means that we are the people of God under his rule, under his authority, under his direction, and we are completely safe. But we have everything we need if God is our king. That's pretty cool. So the kingdom of God is a huge, huge deal in scripture. Matter of fact, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God a lot. Now, we talked about it not just in one way, though. Uh, he, he, he talked about the kingdom of God, and sometimes to some groups of people, when he mentioned the kingdom of God, he, he told these really kind of bizarre stories. You know, they were called parables. And, and, and they, were, they were kind of like talking in language that kept things a little bit secret. So people didn't really get 
what he was talking about. And then after he told the story, the disciples would come by, you know, his, his, his little group of guys that were following him real closely, and he would explain stuff to them, and they still wouldn't get it. All right? But, but the kingdom of God was something that we know, at least one big idea about the kingdom of God, that Jesus said it is so special. It is, is so precious. It is so desirable that you would sell everything that you have in order to achieve it, in order to, to get it, to be your own. I mean, that above all things is, is the main point that Jesus wanted to make to, to the masses is that the kingdom of God is so cool, so great, so awesome that you would give up everything in order to achieve it, in order to gain it. That's cool. Now, um, is the kingdom of God just one thing? Is it just a day and time? Or is it something more than that? Well, in Luke chapter 17, once being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus said, well, the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. You can't see it. And people are going to not be able to say, well, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, there's a big debate among uh, you know, theologians and, and people who make commentary on the Bible uh, about this term, in your midst. Because literally, in the original language, it says, within you. Now, we know that he was talking to Pharisees who didn't really believe in him as the Messiah at the time. So the kingdom of God wouldn't have been in them in particular. So they kind of translate this in your midst, like, I, I'm here, I'm it, I'm the one, I am the kingdom of God. But in reality, the, the, the words are very clear in the original that the kingdom of God is going to be inside of you. Now, we know from other places in Scripture that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you say, I want to live under His rule, under His reign and authority in my life, what happens is the Holy Spirit of God Himself comes and lives where? Inside you, right? So the kingdom of God, represented by God's Spirit, lives right inside your body. Woo! That's cool. See, that's what Jesus is actually saying here, is the kingdom of God is inside of the people who say, yes, I want to be a follower and subject to God's rule and reign in my life. Okay? Now, what does that look like? Well, what does the kingdom of God then look like if God lives inside of us? Well, the Apostle Paul, who was one of the followers of Jesus, he kind of gives us a pretty clear picture of this in the book called Colossians, right? It's a letter that was written to the church, the people who made up the church at Colossae. And there's a list of different things in this scripture that kind of give us an idea about what the kingdom of God is really like. One, love for all of God's people. Love for all of God's people. He says, we pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. So anybody who put their faith in Jesus as their Savior, right? That you have this love for all of God's people. Now, something special happens during Christmas. Um, I remember when I was real little, my mom and dad would give me a dollar, all right? This is back in like the 50s, guys, 1950s, right? Okay? Not the 1850s, the 1950s, all right? <laughs> and they would give me a dollar bill, and then I would have to, with that one dollar bill, buy presents for everybody in my family, okay? <laughs> Grandmas and grandpas, brothers, you know, the whole nine yards, right? And so I would go down to a store called Woolworths. Okay, anybody heard of that? Okay, just a few of you. Yeah, in your history books. You see that in the history books, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, Woolworths, it's called Five and Dime. Five and Dime. And one of the things they had during Christmas time is they had these bins. And they had a five cent bin. Okay, that was so cool, right? So I would go down, I, my grandma, she loved little hankies, right? She always had a handkerchief with her. And, and so that's like a, a portable Kleenex, okay? And uh, <laughs> just for those of you who don't know, right? Okay. So, so I would buy a nickel for that. You know, then I'd buy something you know, for my grandpa and something for my mom and something for my dad. And I had to buy something for my brother. <laughs> right? <sighs> okay. You know, but that's the rule at Christmas time, right? You, you buy for everybody. Why? Because they are a part of your family. And you're supposed to love everybody in your family at Christmas time as hard as it is. <laughs> right? And that's just Christmas rule. You've got to do it. Well, one of the rules for Christian family is you've got to love everybody in your family. Now, that's hard sometimes, right? 
Because, you know, some of you, are, you know, are hard to love. Ah, right? It's some of us are hard to love, right? Yeah, we have our moments. But don't you appreciate it when someone does love you when you're at your worst? Well, see, that's a part of being a part of God's family. Is that you're supposed to be able to express this love for everybody in your family. And, and sometimes it's hard, but that's what we do. We have this love for all of God's people, right? Now, there's a second thing that we have that's a part of God's kingdom in us, and that is a confident hope. Has anybody ever um, bought something and put it on layaway? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, Ray did. Okay, he's old too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, layaway program, and they actually have a commercial, and Kmart does this now, you know? It's like, you know, you can buy something, but you don't get it. You put it on layaway, and then you make payments on it while it stays in the store, and when you pay it off, then you can go and get it so it's still there when you want it, right? Okay, well, that's layaway. Well, you know what, Christians? We have a layaway program for Christmas for Christians. We do, right here. It says this, verse 5. It, it comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved, put it on layaway for you in heaven. Okay? It, basically, he's saying that, you know what? Someday, heaven is going to be more than just this idea. It's going to be real, and the kingdom of God is going to come down, and the, and the city of heaven will descend and land on planet Earth here. Kingdom of God, right here. Right? This is going to be this physical kingdom that's going to be reinstated here on planet Earth, and it's on layaway in heaven right now. Right? But we have this great hope in us that it is genuine. It is real. It is coming. And we're confident that it will happen. Right? Now, third thing, the evidence of God's kingdom in our life is a changed life. Paul goes on. He says, this same good news, it's bearing fruit. It is bearing fruit um, everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard it and understood about God's wonderful grace. Nothing changes people more than understanding what grace is all about. I mean, short definition, grace is getting what you don't deserve. Right? When, when, when you're at your worst, God is at his best. And he died for you when you were still a sinner. And he loves you in spite of the fact that you still mess up. And he pours out this forgiveness and grace that we don't deserve, but we get it. So, I mean, th there are some Christmases I didn't deserve anything from my parents. Just a lump of coal, right? And yet, they love me enough to keep giving, keep caring. And that's what Christianity is all about. It's like we understand that because of God's grace, we can change. We have these second chances, third chances, fourth chances to get it right, right? And God says, you know what? You're going to have a changed life. If, if I'm going to live in you, guarantee you're going to have this life that's changed, that's different from the way you used to be. And it's going to keep on changing. It's going to keep on getting better and better and better, as a matter of fact. And, and how, the, how this changes is uh, the next thing it says that you're going to have this love, not just for your family, but for everybody. For everybody. It says, you learned about the good news from Epaphras, uh, our beloved co-worker. He, he is Christ's faithful servant, and he's helping us on your behalf. He's told us about the love for others the Holy Spirit has given you. See, when, when you become a follower of Jesus and you understand God's grace, suddenly you realize there are people out there who aren't loved. They don't have anybody loving them, and they need someone to love them. And you could be that person. You could be that person to just extend them a kindness. You can care about them. You can say, you know what? Uh, you don't have any friends? I'll be your friend. Right? And so you start having this love for others that goes beyond your boundaries that you'd normally have. And, and then the next thing that I see here is that there is this complete knowledge of God's will that's implanted in us. You see, the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives inside you. And so if God is actually taking up residence, he's there talking inside you. And he's reminding you of the difference between right and wrong. He's saying, you know, this is the way we ought to do it. And, and, and what's really cool is that God gave us this little thing uh, called the Bible, right? And in here are some instructions. Some people call it the instruction manual for Christians, right, on how to live. I mean, you're trying to figure it out. In here, it's in here. There's a lot of not just advice, but instruction, direction. You see, if we say God is the king, he's the ruler of our lives, then he's going to tell us stuff, and that stuff is for our good and the good of others, right? 
And so he says, this goodness, this understanding of God's will, God, God's knowledge is in us. It's a part of God's kingdom that lives in us. And so we know now that we can understand the difference between right and wrong. We can understand what is the best thing to do. Matter of fact, Jesus made it really super simple for us people who are really simple. He says, here, I'm going to give you a grid, all right? Simple grid. You're going to make a decision today? Great. Put it on this grid. Does it help you love God and love others more? If it does, probably okay. If it doesn't contribute to loving God more or loving others more, probably not a good idea. It's, it's that basic, that simple. Because he knew there were going to be a lot of simple people like me in the world who needed to understand how to get it, right? And so he says, here, I'm going to give you the knowledge of God's will. And, and sometimes, you know, we know what the right thing is, and what do we do? We don't do it. Does that help? No, it doesn't help us. It doesn't help others. It doesn't promote God's love. But God says, you know, there's going to be this complete knowledge of God's will. And what it really requires of us is just humility to believe it and then act on it, right? The next thing actually just falls right in line, and that is a life that always honors and pleases God. It says, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. In other words, if you've got this knowledge of God, the complete knowledge of God and his will in your life, that you, you can know, you can tap into that, and if you live that way, you're going to please God. You're going to please God. It'll always honor God and please God. Now, I want to make a little sidebar here. Some people look at this verse and they say, oh, so then it's possible to not please God. If I don't do things the way I know that I should do them, the way that God wants me to do that, then it's like, oh, God's not going to like me anymore. Wrong. Wrong. You see, just because you don't please God doesn't mean he stops loving you. Okay? Matter of fact, that's, that's when his love really kicks in, that he keeps loving you in spite of the fact that you messed up. That's what proves his love, that he loves us so much that when we mess up, he keeps on loving us. So it's not about, you know, making God love you more or not. This is about making sure that your life aligns with his will so it pleases him. It does. It makes him happy. You know, when you, when you did things that your mom and dad wanted you to do, it made him happy, believe it or not. It's like, finally, oh, I'm happy about this, right? So, you know, you can make God happy. You can make him, him pleased with you. Of course he's pleased when you do what's right, and he's grieved when you do what's wrong. But he never stops loving you. Okay? Understand that. That's really, really important. And then if you are living a way that honors and pleases God, guess what happens? You are going to have a life that produces what the Bible calls good fruit. Verse 10 says, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. Now, the fruit that's mentioned in the Bible, some people think, well, this means that, you know, the fruit that I'm going to have is a lot of people accepting Jesus as a, as a result of me. Well, no. Okay, uh, what it means is that there's this increasing fruit of your character of the Holy Spirit who lives in you that's going to start being developed in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are attributes of God, of the Holy Spirit that's inside you that's waiting to get out. See, Paul refers to it in a different way. He says, he says, let the salvation inside you. He says, work out that salvation. In other words, it's already happened inside you. God's living in you. That character, that, that, those qualities are in you. They just need to get out. And, and so, you know, let them get out. Okay? More love, more joy, more patience, more kindness, more, more forgiveness. All that stuff that, that, that is who God is needs to be produced in your life. And if you live according to the way God's wisdom and God's will says in the scriptures, and then you start putting them into practice, what happens is you're going to please God, but you're also going to be producing this new character in your life that reflects who God genuinely is. Okay? Now, this is not going to just happen automatically. And that's why you need the next thing. The next thing is strength to endure with patience. See, we always pray for you to be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. Now, get this. This is really, really important. If you're a Christian and you're, you're trying to live the way God wants you to, and you say, okay, I'm believing that if I do this, my life is going to be changed, my life is going to be transformed, I'm going to become more and more like God in character, okay? It 
is possible. I meet some people and say, well, you know, that's just not how I'm wired, you know. I say, dude, you need to be rewired, okay? Right? The rewiring is possible. The one biggest reason that people don't change is they don't believe they can. They just don't believe it. And they need to start believing it. Because God's word says, the Holy Spirit lives in you. You are a part of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is inside you. And it is waiting to get out. And all we need to do is believe with all of our heart that God can give us the patience and the endurance and the strength, the power to see it happen. Don't give up on it. Don't give up on it in your life. You can, you can become more of the kind of person that God wants you to be. You've got to believe that. And what's the result of that? The next thing, may you be filled with joy. Now, joy is not just this happy feeling that you get, you know, at Christmas time. Joy is this deep-seated contentment. I mean, it's the ability to to, to be at peace with you and yourself and and those around you in spite of the fact that, that, you know, things might be swirling, might be really bad. But deep down inside, you know that God is with you and it's going to be okay. Because, you know, that stuff is laid up for you, right? Eventually, it's all going to be worked out. And so there's this joy that happens when you live in a way that honors and pleases God because you know his will and you're putting it into your life. It's going to produce this new character in you, this new fruit, and you're going to have patience to, to make sure that it happens. Suddenly, you're filled with joy and not just joy, but thanksgiving. You will become a more thankful person. It says, always thanking God the Father. He's enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Now get this. If you don't get anything else today, get this. He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now what tense is that? Past Past tense, you all English majors. Past tense, all right? (laughs) He has This is a done deal. It's already happened. If you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you said, yes, I want to live by his rule. He's going to reign in my life. I'm going to try all these things because I know that it is possible with his power. You are going to be thankful because you have already been transferred from darkness into the kingdom of light. That's pretty cool. All right? That makes every day worth living. He has transferred you, okay? Um, So there is this present kingdom that you are a part of right now. But there's also not just a present kingdom, but a future kingdom, a future kingdom, right? Um, Now, interesting, there's a couple of verses I want you to focus on here with me as we wind things down. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says this, The kingdom of God is not a matter of just talk, But of what? Power. Power. You see, a lot of people talk a good game. Um, Yeah, they want to be Christian. They like the benefits of being saved and not going to hell and all that kind of good stuff. But they like to talk about, but you don't really see the change. You don't see the endurance. You don't see the power in their life. You don't see joy in their life. What's the deal? What's up with that? Well, you know, again, Paul is saying, this is not just a matter of talk. It's a matter of doing It's a matter of God can give you the power to get it done. All right? I'll give you another verse. Summarizes it real well. Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, which is like Christmas all over again, right? It's not about getting what we want, but about living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So you, you you can live this life that aligns with God's will that'll give you peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's pretty cool. So now, when does the future kingdom come? Because in Luke 19, uh, Jesus is talking to a crowd, and, uh, and he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. You see, he understood that there, there's another iteration of the kingdom. There's going to be a physical, you know, overhaul of planet Earth at some point. And he's saying, well, you know, pump the brake on that one. 
And let me tell you how it all is going to spin out. And so he tells another story. And it's kind of, you know, one of these other stories you're going like, oh, thanks for that story, Jesus. You know, here, here it is. You make your own judgment, right? He says, okay, a noble man was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. But before he left, he called together ten of his servants. And he divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, invest this for me while I'm gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation to him to say, we don't want you to be our king. Well, after he was crowned king, he returned. And he called the servants to whom he'd given the money. And he wanted to find out what their profits were. And the first servant said, he reported, Master, I've invested money and made ten times the original amount. And the master said, well done, well done. I'm going to put you in charge of ten cities as your reward. You're going to be the governor of ten cities. Second servant comes up, reports, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. He says, well done. I'm going to make you governor over five cities. And then a third servant came. He said, Master, um, I hid your money. I kept it safe. I kept it safe because I was afraid. I've heard that you were a hard man to deal with. <laughs> That's not very good to say to your <laughs> boss, you know. Uh, taking what isn't yours, harvesting crops you don't plant. Uh, and so he said, the master says, you're a wicked servant. Whoa. Your own words condemn you, he said. I knew that I'm a, if you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I don't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least you could have had some interest on it. So then turning to the others standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the ones, one who had 10 pounds. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds. Yes, the king replied. And to those who use well what they're given, even more is going to be given to them. But from those who do nothing, even with what little they have, will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them. Wow, end of story. Thanks. <laughs> okay. What in the world is this all about? This is the kingdom of God Jesus is talking about. Let me tell you what the, the future kingdom is like. Well, you see, Jesus is the king. And he's going away. He died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sins. He was resurrected from the grave to prove that he was God. And then he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven now. And he's crowned king of the universe. And he's coming back someday. And there are people on planet earth who said, we don't want him to be our king. There's lots of those people around. We don't like Jesus. I mean, he's a good guy and all that. But, you know, pfft, ruler of the you know, universe, I'm not buying, right? And so you say, no way. We don't believe in Jesus. Okay, fine, that's their choice. Their choice, right? And then there are those who say, yeah, I want to be in the part of the kingdom of God. I do, I really do. And God says, great, you know, every one of you, I'm going to give you gifts. I'm going to, I'm going to give you this ability to, to, you know, to prove that you're a part of the kingdom. And so he comes back, and what happens? He says, you know what? I'm going to reward those people that do well. And, and then the question is here, you know, what kind of, what kind of life are we producing while well, Jesus is gone, right? And Jesus wants us to really produce. I mean, at the very least, you know, make a little interest on your life. Well, what is that about? It's, it's about allowing God's spirit to transform you by his, by his knowledge, by his will, and then you become a better person. And, and so, in so doing, people see that. And they, they see more than anything else, one thing grows, it's not money. It's God's love. That God's love is seen more and more in your life. And then it spills over to other people's lives. And they, by, because you love them the way God loves you, they start getting the fact that God loves them too. And they become part of God's kingdom. Now there are those, when Jesus comes back, who unfortunately, because they rejected him, will experience eternal rejection, Right? I mean, that's their choice. That's a sad choice, but it's a choice nonetheless. God doesn't want that to happen. Jesus died for everybody to be saved, right? And, and the word's out there. We need to get it out there more and more. But there are those who initially say they're a part of God's kingdom, but they really aren't. 
Right? Jesus told some other parables about the weeds and the, and the birds and, the, and the, you know, that the seed is on the ground and people go, whoa, yeah, this is great stuff. And then they turn away when stuff gets, gets hard, right? And so there are those who, remember the one thing that, that the kingdom of God is not just about talk, right? It's about power, right? And so if we're going to experience God in our life, it really is about allowing God to transform our life. Now, now, you know, some people, you know, you're afraid you haven't done enough. It's not about doing, you know, so much that you realize, whoa, okay, now I've proven that, you know, I'm a Christian. No, it's not about that. If you're a genuinely a Christian and you're allowing God and inviting him to, to change your life, it might be a little, it might be a lot, but you're being changed. It's okay. You're safe. You're cool, okay? God's not going to, you know, judge you when, when he comes. You're forgiven, you're forgiven. And some of us are going to produce a little. Some of us are produce more. That's okay. That's a part of what God does. Don't be afraid of that. But whatever you have, whoever you are, whatever part of God's kingdom you feel in your life, and, and as God's will is revealed to you, just say, God, make that change real in me. Just help me to say yes to you and experience your power and, and then experience your joy because of it and spread your love more and more. You just be that kind of person and live with that kind of confidence that God has reserved a place for you in heaven. Okay? And it's real. Now, let me give you this last verse. This is awesome. This is awesome. Listen. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That means like die. But we'll all be changed. Okay? Uh, in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That is so cool goes on, it says, thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know, you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It is going to produce a changed life in you. It is going to produce a joy in your life that you maybe haven't experienced to date, okay? And it is going to overflow with love for others so they get what God's love is all about and hopefully become a part of his kingdom too. That's the best Christmas present ever, right? Very cool. Let's pray. God, thank you that you love us, uh, that you love us so much that you're willing to die to make it happen, that we could be restored to a family that loves you. Uh, help us love each other. Help us love those who aren't a part of the family. Uh, but God, uh, we just want to honor and please you uh, because you've implanted the spirit within us. Uh, give us a strength to endure with patience and experience your joy and be thankful people, especially during this time of year, God. Thank you so much for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.